Hi, and welcome to the Imperfection and Imager tutorial video. First of all, let's get the nodes installed. So right now I'm looking at my Patreon, but it'll be in a similar format on the other platform. Just click on the file that you want to download. There are a few options here. So we got Nodepack Imperfection 3 plus Imager 1.0, which is everything. So this is the file I would recommend downloading. So just download the file. Once it's done downloading, open up your downloads folder and then open up your documents folder. You should just be able to search documents in your computer sidebar and the path to the documents folder is C, users, your username, and then documents on Windows that is. Within documents, go to your blender folder and then go to your assets folder and then drag the file from your downloads in to your assets folder. If you do not have a blender or an assets folder, you can create one yourself. If you don't want to store your assets here, or if you're on a different platform such as Mac, or if you installed Blender with Steam, then within Blender, you can go Edit, Preferences, File Paths, the bottom tab, and then just set your asset library to wherever you want to put the file. This will put the file into your assets library, which then you can access from inside Blender. I'm going to switch over to my shading tab just so I have a few extra windows and then switch any window inside of Blender to the asset browser window. Then in the top left of the asset browser window, switch to user library instead of current file. You'll now see nine materials to select from. The first one is the full setup of imperfection and imager, then the full setup of imperfection simplified and imager, then the edge detector node, the imager node, the imperfection three node, the imperfection core node, imperfection simplified controls node, the macro 1.0 node and then the imager masks node. The one I use the most frequently is the second one here. So I'm going to explain this setup first, starting with the imager nodes. All information about these nodes is also present in the manuals provided in the node setup. To open these manuals, simply select the node and press tab. Each manual has the nodes in the middle and the appropriate explanations connected to the inputs. If you'd like to play around with these settings yourself, I would first recommend opening an image texture in this image texture node. I'm going to start with this basic rock texture. The default settings of Imager are already doing a fairly good job mapping this, so you won't always have to tweak anything. So first of all, the texture scale input does what you would expect. Smaller numbers lead to more repetitions and larger numbers zoom in. The tiling scale parameter changes the size of the randomly rotated tiles that detile the surface. Generally, large values lead to a more blurry look. The blur width input changes the size of the blur between randomly rotated tiles. Lower values generally work well for more chaotic surfaces, while smoother surfaces may require a larger blur width. The blur pattern input changes the detail of the blur. Generally, the max value 1 is good for cycles, but lower values may be good for EV because EV handles blur differently than cycles. As you can see here, lower values on the blur pattern make this a little bit more manageable for EV. The rotation amount input changes the amount imager randomly rotates tiles. Small values will result in just a little bit of random rotation, and 360 will result in completely random rotation. The edge smoothing value changes how much the corners of the object are smoothed together. The side rotation input rotates the sides along the X axis. This can be useful if some of the lines on a map texture are not going in the direction you want them to. The texture offset value offsets the texture along all three coordinates. This is useful for quickly centering textures. The triplanar offset value changes how large the triplanar sections on the top and bottom of the object are. This can be useful if the top of your object isn't looking exactly how you want it to. The tile mode parameter changes which mode imager is in. Tile mode 1 is the default and rotates in 3D space, while tile mode 2 maps first and then rotates in 2D space. This allows it to make non-seamless textures seamless by zooming in the tiles. If you have a seamless texture, you should stay with tile mode 1. The tile shape randomness changes the tiles from being random polygons to being perfect squares. This value should generally be set to 0 for things like brick walls, and for organic materials, it should be set to 1. The height seams parameter zooms into each tile and blurs the edges between them. The higher the value, the more zoomed in the images. Generally, with a higher tile shape randomness, you will need the hide seams value to also be higher. The local normals value changes between global normals set at 0 and local normals set at 1. If you are using local object normals, then set local normals to 1. Otherwise, you may get weird texture stretching like this. Or if you are using the imager control parented to the target object, you'll also have to have the local normals set to one in order to prevent texture sliding. Now onto the imager color to PBR node. This takes an input of whatever image you're using for your texture and outputs a color map, roughness map, normal map, displacement map, and a two color depth map. The detection threshold value is the threshold at which imager color to PBR detects depth. When tweaking this value, I recommend having inferred AO strength set to one. This leads to areas imager detects as lower, colored darker. Generally, your detection 
detection threshold should be set somewhere where only a few areas are completely black. The detection inversion value switches which areas imager thinks are high and low. The roughness variation value changes how much the roughness varies from the base roughness set below. The base roughness value changes the average roughness across the object. The bump strength value changes the strength of the normal map. The inferred AO strength value changes the strength of the inferred ambient occlusion which is added to the color map of the object. The displacement scale value changes the scale of the displacement on the object. The infer mask threshold value changes the threshold at which depth is detected for the infer mask output. The grayscale mode value changes if the texture is treated as a grayscale texture or a color texture. Generally, for full grayscale objects, this should be set to 1, and for color objects, it can be set to 0. But values in between can produce interesting results. With all these values set properly, you can get out a realistic PBR material from just one color input. Now for Imperfection 3, Simplified Controls. All the settings under Default Settings are just the same settings as on the default Principled BSDF. This means any Principled BSDF can be easily replaced with an Imperfection node. On the simplified version of Imperfection, there is only four sliders. The Age slider, which automatically controls all of the effects normally present inside of Imperfection. The Preset value, which changes the color palette of the texture. The Texture Scale value, which changes the scale of the texture. On on this slider, lower values zoom in and higher values zoom out. By default, when using world coordinates, texture scale is set to a physically accurate value. So as long as you're scaling your objects in a realistic way, you won't need to touch this. The local normals value does the same thing as it does on Imager. It switches between global normals and local normals. If you are experiencing texture stretching artifacts, you may want to toggle this value. By default, the texture coordinate node is set to the imperfection control coordinates, which has the benefit of you not needing to apply scale or rotation when editing objects. The global switch node and the global baked images node are both used for baking and we'll cover that later. Now moving on to the full version of the imperfection node which is a lot larger than the simplified version. Once again everything under default settings is the exact same as the base principled BSDF. On the full version of the imperfection node the age slider changes the width of the crevice and edge wear effects. The texture scale input does the same thing it does on the simplified version. Once again the default value of 1 when combined with the default imperfection control is a physically accurate value. The wear strength parameter changes the strength of the wearing on the edges of the object. Values of 1 will lead to a more pronounced and brighter wear effect, while values closer to 0 disable the effect. Keep in mind that this value also applies to the normal map of the object. The crevice wear slider changes how much of the wear effect is present in the crevices and corners of the object, as opposed to just the edges. Values of 1 will make it completely visible in crevices, while values near 0 will remove the effect. If you feel like the cracks of your object are too bright, turn this value down. The crevice dirt color parameter changes the color of the dirt in the corners of the object. Darker colors are normally less visible, but also more realistic. The crevice dirt strength parameter changes the strength of the crevice dirt effect. Keep in mind with any of these values, you can type a value above the maximum for extreme effects. The auto beveling strength parameter changes the strength of the fake beveling effect. This value is also influenced by the age slider. The detection randomization slider changes how much randomization there is to the thickness of the wear and crevice dirt effects. Values near zero will lead to a completely straight edge, while higher values lead to a more realistic varied edge effect. The noise detail parameter changes the detail of all noise nodes in imperfection. Anything above 13 is generally not visible, while lower values lead to lower quality but faster rendering results. The roughness variation slider changes how much the effects are allowed to vary the base roughness of the object. The local normals value does the same thing it does on the simplified controls and imager nodes. The wear distance multiplier value independently changes the width of edge wear. The AO or ambient occlusion distance multiplier independently changes the width of all ambient occlusion effects. Now we're getting to the additional effects. The sun bleaching slider adds simulated sun bleaching to the object. The sun bleaching is the most pronounced on top, a little bit on the sides, and none at the bottom. The sun bleaching shade multiplier changes the the distance the sun bleaching is allowed to get to corners. The sun bleaching color value changes the color of the sun bleaching effect. Sometimes slightly yellow values can be more realistic than a pure white. For metallic objects, a slightly blue tint can have an interesting effect. The dust slider changes the amount of dust on the object. Dust settles on the top of objects, a small amount on the sides, and accumulates in corners. The fingerprint and dirt wipe sliders, which we'll get to in a bit, are also visible on the dust effect. The dust color input changes the color of the dust. Slightly brown colors can be more realistic outdoors and red and orange colors can be useful for things like scenes on Mars. The mud spray slider changes the amount of mud present on the object. Mud spray starts at the bottom of the object and streaks onto the size a small amount. The mud spray color input changes the color of the mud. If there's a lack of contrast between the mud and the object, like here, you may want to make it darker. The mud spray side strength parameter changes the strength of the mud on the sides of the object. 
If you don't want mud on the sides of your object, change this to zero. The mud spray height value changes how high the mud goes up the sides of the object. The mud spray direction parameter requires a vector input and can change the direction the mud is coming from. This is especially useful on moving objects such as cars and trains. The mud spray stretch value changes how stretched the mud is. Higher values lead to a more streaked appearance, giving the impression of higher speed, while lower values grant a more uniform look. The mud spray mode input switches between three modes of where the stopping point of the mud is calculated. Mode 1 will use the generated coordinates of the object to decide where the mud is calculated. This means that scaling the object up and down will stretch or shrink how far the mud goes, and while rotating the object, the mud will always stay where the bottom of the object was. Mode 2 uses object coordinates instead of generated coordinates. This will behave the same as generated coordinates until you apply the rotation, and then the mud will behave how you expect it to. Applying the scale will also change how far the mud is stretched up. However, it may stretch up too far for your liking. The mud spray offset slider, which only works in mode 2 allows you to adjust this. Mud spray mode 3 allows you to input your own set of coordinates to decide where the mud stops. This mode will generally not need to be used though. The fingerprint slider changes the strength of the fingerprints effect. While this does affect the roughness map, it is more visible when turning on dust. Higher values will lead to darker fingerprints, and lower values will remove the fingerprints altogether. The fingerprint amount slider changes how many fingerprints are on the surface. Values near 1 lead to a pretty unrealistic effect, but it can be interesting, and lower values can be used for things that aren't touched as frequently. The dirt wipe slider changes the strength of the dirt wipe's effect. Once again, higher values will lead to the dirt wipes looking darker when combined with dust, and lower values will remove the effect altogether. The scratches values changes the strength of scratches on the object's surface. Larger values will lead to a large amount of deep scratches, while lower values will make the effect much less noticeable. The macro strength slider changes the effect of the macro node built into imperfection. The macro node adds slight variation to the roughness and color maps of the object. This effect is quite subtle, but helps add a little bit of realism. The texture vector input behaves the exact same it does on the imperfection simplified version, and once again we'll be covering the global baked images node and the global switch node when we cover how to bake textures. Now onto the imager masks node. The scale slider changes the scale of all effects on the masks node. On this slider, larger values zoom in and smaller values zoom out. It also acts kind of like a universal threshold value. The crevices threshold slider changes the threshold of where crevices are detected. This behaves roughly the same as the scale value, but only applies to the crevice mask. The edges threshold slider changes the threshold at where edges are detected. The thickness threshold slider changes the threshold at where thick and thin areas are detected, which is more visible here if I add a thin area to the object. The pointiness threshold slider changes the threshold at which pointy and flat areas are detected. The steepness bias slider biases the steepness mask to the top or bottom of the object. This is especially useful when working with terrain. The flatness threshold slider changes the threshold at which areas are considered flat and steep. Keep in mind that the flatness mask shows how closely geometry aligns with one of the main three axes. The automatic normal slider switches between using the internal normals of the node and using an external normal map given by the normal input. This is especially useful if you want the mask to respond to the normal map. The local normal slider switches between using global normals and local normals. It behaves the exact same way as on all the other imperfection and imager nodes. By default, the edge detector node that comes with imperfection behaves somewhat similarly to imager's mask node, specifically the edges mask, but it has a bit more control. The age slider changes the width of the edges detected. The age slider also changes the distance of ambient occlusion. The master scale slider changes the scale of all the effects used in the node. The crevice wear slider, just like on imperfection, removes the edge wear effect on the concave edges of the object. The AO or ambient occlusion distance multiplier changes how far out this crevice wear is detected. The wear distance multiplier independently changes the distance that edge wear is calculated, and the detection randomization slider, just like on imperfection, adds some slight variation to the edge detection algorithm. Now onto the macro node. The hue variation strength slider changes how much hue variation is present on the object. This can be an easy way to achieve a sort of discoloration effect. The saturation variation strength slider changes how much the saturation is allowed to vary. This can kind of lead to a sun bleachy effect. And the value variation strength slider changes how much the value, or lightness and darkness, of the object vary. The noise style slider changes the look of the the variation noise. The noise roughness slider changes the roughness of the noise. The noise detail slider changes the detail of all noise textures in the object. Values above 13 generally don't bring any more visible detail. The noise layer 1 scale value changes the scale of the largest scale of noise, or at least largest by default. The noise layer 2 scale slider does the same thing for the second layer of noise, and the noise layer 3 scale does the same thing for the smallest layer of noise. The overall strength slider blends between the original input 
and the output. Now for the imperfection core settings. Just like on the other imperfection nodes, the default settings section is the exact same as the principled BSDF. And while there are less of them, the imperfection settings are also the same as on the base node. So age controls edge wear and crevice dirt. Texture scale changes the scale of all effects. Wear strength changes the brightness of the wear on the edges of the object. Crevice wear removes edge wear in the crevices of the object. Crevice dirt color changes the color of the dirt in the crevices. Crevice dirt strength changes the strength of the dirt in the crevices. Auto beveling strength changes the strength of the auto beveling effect. Detection randomization adds slight variation into how edges and crevices are detected. Noise detail changes the detail level of all noise nodes used in imperfection. Roughness variation controls how much the roughness is able to vary from the base roughness of the object. Wear distance multiplier changes how far out the edge wear effect goes. And AO or ambient occlusion distance multiplier changes how far crevice dirt is allowed to go out from the crevices. Now onto the imager camera effects node, which you can add to the compositor through shift A, template, imager camera effects. If you want to be able to add nodes through a menu like this, simply go to edit, preferences, add-ons, look up node, enable node presets, in preferences change the directory to the same place you store your blender assets, and then just press shift A and you'll see a new sub menu called template. Render an image and then go into the compositing tab and then add a viewer node by control shift clicking on the imager camera effects node. This is only possible with the add-on node wrangler, which is also a built-in blender add-on that you can enable. The noise floor amount setting changes the strength of the film grain added to the image. Note that this will make your image lighter by default. The multiplicative grain amount changes the strength of grain that is multiplied with the image rather than added to it. This type of grain will generally darken the image. Having the noise floor amount and multiplicative grain amount at the same value generally retains the value of the original image. The small bloom strength slider changes the strength of bloom right around the edges of bright areas. So a small bloom off you can see this edge is a little bit more harsh and with it on it subtly softens a little bit. On brighter objects this effect will be more pronounced. The large bloom strength slider changes the strength of large bloom applied to the image. Large bloom extends out a lot farther than small bloom and is a lot more noticeable. The bloom dirt amount slider changes the amount of lens dirt that is combined with the bloom effect. This is what is causing the bokeh effect you can see here. The chromatic aberration strength slider changes the strength of the chromatic aberration effect you can see here. Keep in mind that chromatic aberration is generally an artifact of low quality lenses. So if you are simulating a high quality lens, you may not want to have this very high. The vignette strength slider changes the strength of the vignette added to the edges of the image. By default, this effect is pretty subtle, but it can be made quite extreme by turning the slider up to one. The green tint slider changes how much green tint is added to dark areas. This is what the wall looks like with green tint on, and this is what it looks like with green tint off. Keep in mind, many of these sliders can be set above their recommended values. Now for baking with imperfection and imager. I'm using the simplified controls version for this demonstration, but it's exactly the same with the full setup. Keep in mind that baking is not available for imperfection core. First of all, I'm gonna set up a simple texture. All right, so now let's say we wanna bake this texture. First of all, you'll need to grab this Blender Baker add-on. It is completely free, but you can pay for it if you'd like. Once you have downloaded the add-on, you can add it to Blender by going File, Preferences, Add-ons, Install, and then finding the zip file for the add-on wherever you put it, and then make sure you enable it as well. Now with the add-on installed, press N on your viewport to open up this menu, and then go to the tab labeled BBB. First, set a path for your baked images. Once you have set that, set the resolution to whatever you would like. Keep in mind that the bake time goes up a lot for larger textures. Then change the bake workflow to bake low res surface, and then press create bake collection with the object you'd like to bake selected. You can also do this when selecting multiple objects. Just make sure none of the UVs on their UV maps overlap, and we'll get to how to make that happen in a second. Now down in the bake passes menu, add four bake passes. The four bake passes you'll need are diffuse, roughness, base color, and normal. Open up the dropdowns under all these passes, and then for each one, set the sample type to set, however many samples you want. I normally go with 128. The bake scene to temporary scene. Keep in mind, if you're working with something close to an object, such as this plane here, in a temporary scene, this dirt that reacts to the object's position will not be present. If you still want this dirt to be present, make sure you set it to current scene instead of temporary scene. Just keep in mind that it'll take a little bit longer. And then set the post process to denoise. Now, to make sure the UV map is set up, you can temporarily close this tab, press tab to go into edit mode, select everything, with A in the top bar or just by pressing U. Press the Smart UV Project option. All the settings here are good by default and just click OK. This will map everything on your object to a UV map with no overlapping edges. You don't need to worry about how clean your UV map is because we are going to be projecting the current texture, which is already clean, directly onto that UV map. If you have multiple objects, you can also select them all at the same time by clicking one, shift clicking the other, and then pressing tab to go into edit mode, and then doing the same thing, U Smart UV Project. The objects you have selected do not 
not have to share the same texture, they just have to share the same global baked images instance. If you ever want to bake two collections separately, you'll have to make a duplicate of this global baked images node and a duplicate of this global switch node. You can do this simply by pressing the two. To demonstrate that this will work with multiple textures at once, I'm going to make a duplicate of this texture and set certain faces on this cube to be that texture. All right, there we go. Now some faces are set to bricks as well. Before you bake your textures, make sure you switch imperfection to baking mode by selecting the global switch button, pressing tab, and then switching the mode to two. If you see a weird purpley greeny look here, then you know it's in the correct mode. Now you can go ahead and press the bake selected objects button under the bake all collections button in the blender baker. Make sure you have all objects you want to bake selected when you do this. I'd recommend going into flat shading mode just so you aren't taking up any resources trying to render your object in the viewport. Note that baking an imperfection object is likely going to take longer than rendering your entire scene, so only do it if you're making an animation or if you plan to do a lot of test renders of your scene. Now go into the global baked images node by selecting it and pressing tab and to locate the diffuse, roughness, base, color, and normal maps, this location will be the same as the path under image settings in the Blender Baker. Once you find the location, I recommend copying the path at the top of the Blender file view, as it doesn't automatically go to where you left off. Once you have all these selected, you can press tab to go back out of the node, and then go back into the global switch node. Here, switch the mode to 3. This is now the baked image. You can always bake another image by switching back to mode 2, and any bakes after the first will not require you to find the files again. It will just automatically overwrite the same files and the bake will be updated. After baking with an imperfection node on the simplified version you can still change the preset although keep in mind this will not affect the sun bleaching color like it normally would and you can also individually change the dust color, mud color, and crevice dirt color on the full imperfection node. You can also adjust everything in the base principled BSDF settings such as the metallicness of the object, the transmission, and everything else except for the base color, base roughness, and base normal parameters. If you want your bake texture to work in Eevee because by default imperfection 3 is a cycles only material simply unplug the baking BSDF and BSDF inputs to the global switch. This will prevent it from trying to compile all the nodes inside of Imperfection 3 and crashing your blender, and then switch it over to either All or Eevee. Keep in mind you'll have to do this on all textures involved. It may take a second for the textures to load in, but once they do, you'll have smooth viewport performance. All right, that's all for now. If you have any further questions, comment down below and I'll answer them. And thank you for choosing the Imager and Imperfection node bundle. See you later.